All right, so thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the presentation, and I'm uh, very proud to be here. Uh, probably uh, something that uh, people in the audience know here very well is, you know, if you have nanoparticles, you usually, you can grow a crystal, and this crystal is going to grow until you run out of particles to assemble the whole crystal. What I want to talk about is self-assembly of structures that grow to a critical size, and then they stop growing or self-limited self-assembly. And one example of such self-limited self-assembly is uh, a, a case of lipid bilayers. An example of such a, a, of such a material is actually a lipid bilayers, something that is a hydrophobic core and a hydrophilic head, and you start assembling this liquid-like sheet and, you, and, and this, of course, is important in technology and biology. This is an EM picture of, a, of lipid structures within a vesicle, and they have this amazing shape to ability to create all of these diverse three-dimensional topological shapes. Something that, uh, that is interesting about the lipid bilayer is you might think that you could just grow a lipid bilayer laterally, uh, and it would continue to grow, but that's actually not the case, right? is if you can imagine a flat lipid sheet as shown over here, right? This is a one rod length sheet. And if you continue to grow this sheet, you have no bending energy, right? The sheet wants to be flat, but you have the edge tension. The edge of the sheet is exposed and that creates some line tension. And this line tension is gonna increase as you increase the size of the sheet, it's gonna be the di diameter, the circumference of the sheet times the line tension of the sheet. And so as the sheet gets larger, the, the edge energy increases. Now you can eliminate this edge energy by simply taking the sheet and folding it into a, an edgeless vesicle that eliminates the edge energy, but of course it takes some energy to bend the sheet into a closed vesicle. And that energy is actually independent of the vesicle size. Locally, the curvature goes as one over R squared, and then when you integrate it over the entire vesicle, you get something that is a constant, and it's just proportional to kappa. Kappa is the, how difficult is it to bend the sheet? And so you can imagine, and this is what happens, as you grow your flat sheet, at some point, the, the energy of the vesicle becomes lower than the energy of a disc, and this spontaneously transitions into a vesicle, a flat sheet. You can compare the free energies, and this roughly happens at a, at a, at a critical size that's it's proportional to the bending rigidity of the sheet and inversely proportional to the edge tension. Now, you know, bending rigidity of a lipid bilayer is a few kBT, the edge energy of a lipid bilayer is about 100 kBT. So this, if you grow a lipid bilayer, it's going to close into a vesicle spontaneously when you're of the order of 10 nanometers or so. So you have no, you, 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 it's very challenging to observe these dynamics on these time scales and length scales. And so I want to tell you a little bit about, about a model system in which we believe we can, in which we can study this transition from something that's flat to something that's closed. Yes. Yeah, there's this kappa bar, and I can discuss that. Happy to discuss that. I, I, I yes, but I, I, I'm happy to discuss it. So, how do we assemble these sheets, right? So, so this is our nanoparticle. This is a rod-like virus. It's about six nanometers in diameter. It's about one micron in length. And these viruses are, you know, uh, uh, good particles to study self-assembly. They are chemically homogeneous, not chemically heterogeneous. They are monodisperse. They have tunable, you know, we can engineer their chirality, their aspect ratio. We can engineer how rigid they are. And they are charged. And so, you know, there's salt in solution. And so there's effective diameter that's set by the ionic strength of the rods. What we do is simply mix these rods with a, with a depleting, with a non-absorbing polymer, and this induces something that's well known, a depletion interaction. What happens is when you have two rods, 
uh, you know, uh, there's an overlap of excluded volume. There's a higher polymer concentration of the outside and inside, and that leads to the attraction between two rods. Now, the rods attract in a very different way than spheres, because if you have rods, I don't know if you have these two chalks, which are two rods, right? They want to come together, but then they want to maximize the overlap length. And if they're, they're, they, if they are in this configuration, they want to, you know, they'll minimize the energy by, by minimizing their center to center distance, right? And you can imagine if you take a third rod, a fourth rod, very soon you'll start to assemble a small sheet-like structure that's going to grow laterally in size. And that's indeed what happens, right? So now, instead of going, uh, now we switch to optical microscopy, and so this is a schematic of a small disk-like structure of, of aligned rod-like particles. This is viewed from the top, so there's about, this is a micron in size, few microns in size, so there's about 10,000 rods over here. This is viewed from the side, and this is one rod length tick. You can watch these little disks float around in a suspension, and they never stack on top of one another. Again, I'm happy to discuss that. But what they do is they coalesce laterally to create larger monolayer sheets of aligned rods. On long time scales, what you observe is you observe sheets. Again, this is from the top. This is from the side. This is, you know, a very soft liquid uh, sheet. This is tens of nanometers in diameter. Again, all the rods here are pointing into the direction. This is sedimented on a top surface, and there's polymer that's holding this sheet together and preventing it from falling apart, right? So, so the concentration is determined by the osmotic pressure exerted by the polymer. You know, this is a system that is very amenable to different uh, uh, visualization techniques. So for example, here we label one out of 10,000 rods, and you can indeed see these rods as points, and you can see that this is a liquid-like sheet. These things have a mean square displacement that increases linearly with time. Here you can see a sheet that's edge on, and so this kind of view tells you what are the fluctuations on the elastic length scale, and then you can see what's happening on a microscopic length scale as well. So what I want to, you know, so, so, so the, in, in a certain way, these things do look like lipid bilayers, but there's a big difference is that lipid bilayers form a closed vesicle, and these things form flat sheets. When they're on top of one another? Actually, so that's what gave us a lot of trouble. Any junk that you have in the system will go to the edge. It doesn't want to go into the membrane. It doesn't want to go to the polymer. And that poisons the ends and suppresses them from lateral coalescence. And so this is the kind of normal system that you would see. These things would be tens of microns in diameter, right? Now, we know what the bending rigidity is, and we know what the edge tension is. And so that tells us at what point should these things fold up into a, a closed sheet? And so this is a virus length. This is a wild type virus. It's of the order of one micron. And so if I increase the diameter at some point, this flat sheet should close up into a vesicle that's shown over here. But this is going to happen when the sheet is of the order of one millimeter, right? Or even larger. We are never going to see that. But the way that I can reduce this critical size where the sheet falls into vesicle is by reducing the virus length. The virus length determines the bending rigidity, and actually the bending rigidity goes as virus length cube. And so if I go down to 200, 300 microns, then the, vi the vesicle should form on the length scale of about 100 to a few hundred microns. And so I might have a chance of observing this transition from flat sheets to uh, to close vesicles. Again, this is our wild type virus. Its length is determined by how long is the DNA. We simply chop the DNA. We can make these viruses anywhere from 100 to many microns. This is a 350 micron long rods, and this is what we'll be working on for the rest of the talk, right? And so you make these membranes out of these uh, shorter rods, and you know. And so this is what I want to discuss quickly go to these points. I want to show that these actually do form colloidal vesicles. 
And, uh, you know, and then I want to discuss the pathways that generate the vesicle and the pathways by which a vesicle disassembles into a flat sheet. So we made these colloidal vesicles with 350 nanometer rods. We had to really worry about this poisoning of the edges, and that took us a few years to solve, but now it works pretty well. And this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a confocal reconstruction of a three-dimensional closed vesicle. You know, again, this is about 100 by 100 nanometers in, in, in size, right? And so this really looks like, uh, you know, the donut of the German variety, not the American one, I guess. Uh, you know, what you can, op you can see is that its vesicle actually, you know, this is the, the XZ profile, it's getting compressed because they are so large that the gravity is distorting them, right? And again, you can continue, you know, you, we, we observe a, 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 these vesicles that are assembled from these rod-like nanoparticles, and they range in size from something, you know, that's quite small to something that's quite a bit larger. And this is the average volume of the vesicles, volume cubed, right? And so, you know, this is hundreds of microns in size, and you can really see that they almost look like red blood cells, but on a much larger length scales. So what we want to do is we want to predict the vesicle shape, right? And there's a very well-established theory of, uh, by Helfrich from, from many years ago uh, uh, that, that predicts what, how an elastic sheet minimizes its free energy. There is a mean curvature uh, modulus, and this is the mean curvature. It's multiplied by a modulus. There's a Gaussian modulus. I'm, again, very happy to discuss that. It plays a subtle role in the system. There's various Lagrange multipliers that we need to use, and there's the edge energy, right? And you can minimize this. There's also gravitational potential energy. You can take this and minimize the energy, and this is what the energy predicts would be the shape of the vesicle, right? So what we are doing here is we are changing the parameter alpha, alpha scales with the size, area of the vesicle, density of the vesicle, this is G times the local density of the vesicle, and it's inversely proportional to K, which is the bending rigidity, right? So if you have small a or large K, what happens is you have a vesicle that's inflated, that's more or less spherical. If you have a very small vesicle, what happens is you get sagging of the vesicle and you observe a structure like this where the vesicle really collapses on itself. And so that is the parameter alpha. In principle, what you could have is you could also have vesicles that are underinflated or overinflated. If you have an overinflated vesicle, right, parameter V tilde, when you have V tilde equals to one, that means that the pressure inside and outside the vesicle is the same. Here, if you have a parameter V tilde that's smaller than one, then you're deflating the vesicle. The vesicle uh, gets more concave shape, and if you increase V tilde, that means the pressure inside is larger and it's gonna inflate the vesicle. We can measure all these parameters. Again, I don't wanna go into too many details, but this is the, you know, this is a two-dimensional scan of this membrane and how it fluctuates and you can measure the bending rigidity, which is of the order of 11,000 kBT. The bending rigidity of a lipid bilayer is few kBT, but this thing is about 1,000 times thicker than, the, than that of the lipid bilayer, and so that's why it's so much more rigid. You can also look at the edge of this membrane, and you can see these fluctuations of the edge tell you what the line tension is, and the line tension of this membrane is about 350 kBT. And if you remember, you know, the, st the stability criteria for this was four times uh, 11,000 over 350, so this thing should close up when they're of the order of 100 microns, which is indeed what we, de what we observe experimentally. Again, so we can measure, ca we independently measure the bending rigidity, we independently measure the line tension, we experimentally measure what is the volume of the vesicle. We experimentally measure what the area of the vesicle is. And without any adjustable parameters, you can predict the shape of the vesicle using this Helfrich uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, yes. 
You can see here you have a vesicle size, and this is the error in the mistake by which we can, you know, this is 0.05% error. And most of the time we can predict the shape of the vesicle to within 1%. This should be 1%. The other thing that you should understand is we also plot this V tilde, which tells you if these vesicles are overinflated or underinflated. The tilde tends to be underinflated. That means that the tilde is for small vesicle is very close to one, right? That's the red part. But as the vesicle gets larger, these vesicles get underinflated. That means that there's less polymer inside and more polymer on the outside. This is a very robust self-assembly process. This is, again, millimeters by millimeter scale, scale sample. And you can see there's just this forest of vesicles. And if you zoom in, most of these vesicles actually closed up. And what we actually want to do is we, you know, here the analysis becomes very challenging because of the, because vesicles interact with one another. But, uh, you know, so when we do analysis, we look at isolated vesicles. These things are very large. These things assemble on a very small time scale. And so we have a unique opportunity to actually visualize the dynamics by which these vesicles form and by which these vesicles disassemble. And so how do we assemble these vesicles? Again, you have this nanoparticle sheet. And you know what I haven't talked about is gravity. But if you just let it assemble onto surface, what you'll see is that it starts gently curving on the surface. But it will rarely, if ever, close by itself if it has to work against the gravity. So what we do is we take a sample like this. Experimentally, we just flip it by 180 degrees. And then the gravity is helping you. And you can see that this sheet starts falling down and starts forming this vesicle-like structure. And here, the pinching has not quite finished yet, right? This is a very large-scale event. Again, this is zoomed out. And you can see all of these sheet, liquid sheets sedimenting down to the bottom and forming these closed vesicles. This is what happens at the intermediary steps, right? These vesicles are attached to the ceiling. They look like a pendant droplet, and they're elongated. They're elongated just like what a lipid bilayer would look like if you pull on it. You can predict the shape of these vesicles. Again, we can measure everything. We have our free energy. We can, uh, we can constrain now the boundary conditions. And you can see this is the theoretical prediction for the shape of these pendant vesicles. and uh, you know, we do, again, we can describe the vesicles uh, 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 under the influence of gravity uh, quite well, right? This is a movie of a, of a, of a vesicle as, a, or, or of a vesicle information, right? So you get this pendant membrane droplet. It's slowly elongating. This is of the order of few hours, right? So you have a lot of time to watch this dynamics. You can see as it's elongating, its area is increasing. That's the blue thing over here, right? You can see this is the surface area. So what's meaning is that this pendant membrane is recruiting material from the top, and it's slowly falling towards the bottom. And that elongates the vesicle. And at some point, uh, uh, you know, this is a very slow process. And this is actually determined the dynamics of this sedimentation is determined by the rate at which the polymer can go through the neck and into the interior of the vesicle. Now in the second part, this is what happens. You, you get a fracture-like event, and the vesicle forms to the bottom. And then once the fracture occurs, you get this very thin ribbon-like structure that connects the vesicle to the ceiling of the material. You can see this twisting motion. And at some point, this movie actually takes a bit of time, you'll see that there's going to be a rupture event. There's still an opening here, right? And at, you know, uh, at some point, there's going to be a rupture here. And this tether is going to retract, and the vesicle is, will spontaneously close. And this explains why a lot of our vesicles are underinflated. What's happening here is that the polymer has to flow inside and there's two time scales. There's a rate at which the polymer can come into the membrane to, to, to equilibrate the pressure. 
and the rate of disclosure. And so, for example, here you can see in a probably better resolution another closure event where this vesicle is formed and, uh, you know, where this neck ruptures and the vesicle closes upon itself. So this, uh, you know, this uh, describes the steps and we can visualize the steps about how gravity assists the assembly of these colloidal or nanoparticle vesicles. You first, in a step one, you get a formation of elongated tethers that minimize the energy, and then you have this sudden fracture event that's followed by the vesicle closure. And we are definitely looking into quantifying this fracture event in more details. Now what I want to do is, you know, again, what I said is if you have a small sheet, what you're going to see, a small sheet, you want to have a flat two-dimensional surface. A large sheet is a closed vesicle. What we really want to do now is you want to start with a vesicle and simply shrink it and see by, by a pathway by which a closed vesicle is going to rupture and form a flat sheet. The way we do that is we, we reduce the solution ionic strength in situ. That increases the repulsive interactions between the charged nano, nano rods that leads to their slow evaporation and that slowly shrinks the area of the vesicle. And at some point, you're going to cross this barrier and form a flat sheet. But the dynamics by which this kinetics proceeds is nothing but obvious. So for example, here, this is the area. And this is how fast the area is decreasing, right? And so you can see on the order of five to six hours, the area is roughly reduced. And that's because the rods are slowly leaving the membrane and the membrane is getting smaller. And so you can see here, this is initiated by an event. The vesicle is getting smaller. There's polymer encapsulated within the vesicle. And the polymer builds up pressure, which builds up the surface tension onto the membrane. And so what that leads to is creation of small pore that nucleates and opens. And the polymer can then escape through the pore. It releases the tension in the membrane, and the, and the membrane closes up on itself, right? And this, you have this dynamics of pore nucleation, growth, and resealing, and it repeats many, many times until the vesicle gets small enough to disassemble. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the vesicle. Again, you can see, you know, we can visualize this in 3D. You can see these pores continuously open and close. Again, this is a fluid membrane. You know, once you rupture it, it can self-heal. And this is going to continue for, again, several hours as this vesicle is getting smaller and smaller. Eventually, you're going to get to this regime where the vesicle is so small that the pore cannot close itself anymore, right? And that happens, I think, at this point over here, right? So here you have a pore, and this pore will no longer close, and you create this kind of sem stable semi-bulbous shape that's shown over here. Now, if you continue to watch this, something quite surprising happens. You start with the structure. It's a semi, it's a fairly, you know, it's a metastable structure. You have this opening, and this thing wants to transition into a flat sheet. So what happens, and this was quite unexpected, is you actually nucleate a second pore, and you create a tube-like structure, and this tube-like structure then transforms into a sheet, right? Why this is happening is entirely not obvious, right? You wouldn't, you know, you would not really expect this. But I think we have some insight and intuition for why this happens, right? Again, this happens, you know, this is an example of this two pathway disassembly. You have one pore, you create a, you nucleate a second pore, you grow this kind of disc-like, uh, tube-like shape. And, you know, at this point you have the tube it has the same opening on both sides. And then at some point, one of the openings starts closing and the other opening grows, right? So there's, uh, if you reduce the size of the vesicle much faster, right? So for example, over here, what happens is you can also get a one pore 
this assembly right here. You have one pore, it starts opening, and eventually you just create a flat sheet as is shown over here. Again, this time scales are hundreds of minutes, this time scales are tens of minutes. This is just a movie of this one pore transition, for example, over here, right? You can see a bunch of these vesicles, they are slowly evaporating. Once they cr reach a critical size, they slowly transition into a flat sheet and this happens quite robustly. So what, you know, in, in the last five minutes, I just wanna, you know, tell you a little bit about insight about what governs this dynamical pathway, right? So what you can do is you can look at this structure at any point during this, this assembly, right? And so here I, I know I've measured the three-dimensional surface. I know what the area is, uh, and you know what the volume is, and you can simply fit, this is the theoretical prediction, and this is the experimental measurement. So this dynamics of this assembly is happening slow enough that at any point, the structure minimizes its free energy, or its, its energy, right? And you know, again, it does a pretty good job because this process is so slow. So now what you can do is you can plot the free energy landscape, and this is, for example, a free energy landscape for very large vesicles, where vesicles, are, where vesicles are stable. This is a very large area. R1 is the opening of one pore, and R2 is opening of the second pore. And you can see that the global minimum is when R1 and R2 are zero. You know, this is a stable vesicle situation, right? The spore, uh, the pores, when they are created, are unstable, and the vesicle closes up on itself. Now, as you reduce the vesicle area, at some point, this becomes metastable, right? And actually, this is the point, the free energy landscape, where things become interesting. What here you can see is now you have a metastable vesicle. The global minima is when either R1 or R2 are infinitely large, right? This is, the min this is a local global minima, and this is a local minima, right? This is a minima where you actually have two small openings, right? Now you can see, if I want to go from here along this pathway, you can actually see that there is a barrier along this pathway to go from one to the other, right? And the fastest way down this free energy landscape is to actually go along this pathway, right? So this is the pathway in which both R1 and R2 are opening at the same rate. And then you reach the saddle point, and then once you reach the saddle point, you decide to go either in this direction or this direction where either R1, one opening starts growing and the other opening starts shrinking. And so this is the pathway, you know, you can start from something like, he, like this point and go down the fastest minimum descent, and this is what the theory would predict, and qualitatively this works pretty well compared to the experiments that we see. Um, so this is, you know, this is, the, this is the pathways of vesicle disassembly, right? It's a two-step pathway. You first have this vesicle contraction, which is really a cascade of pore opening and pore closing, and this is actually something that's been observed and studied in lipid bilayers, but in this system, you know, because of the length scales and time scales involved, you can directly visualize a lot of the dynamics of this. And then you have this vesicle to disc transition that is explained by this free energy landscape, we believe. So what is the outlook, right? So, so the systems now work pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, when they work well, they work pretty well. Uh, so something that we would like to do in the future is, you know, photo cross-link vesicles, right? So, so these things, have about 30% water content, right? So they, are, they have very well-defined pore sizes, and one could imagine that one could for, form this self-assembled vesicle and then photo cross-link it, and this would be, uh, you know, uh, a nanometer size filtration uh, device uh, that would probably be quite photo-selected, right? The other thing that we want to do is we want to visualize the mechanism of pore nucleation. Right now, what we do is we just use confocal microscopy. We can visualize these things with a time resolution of 10 seconds. We are doing, we are developing tomographic imaging in my lab, and that should speed up our imaging by about, you know, at least two to three orders of magnitude. 
And so we are hoping to really say what happens in the vesicle when you nucleate that pore, and that's a challenge. The other thing that you can do is, for example, take vesicles. This is, this is sheets, and these are sheets of two rods of different chirality, and in two dimensions, the sheets actually spontaneously phase separate and form this finite size rafts, and so something that we would be very interested in is actually taking these kind of uh, heterogeneous uh, structures and folding them into vesicles, and we can control the size of these rafts in quite a bit of detail, and uh, you know, one could imagine then creating, you know, photo cross-linking one of the components and creating all kinds of porous three-dimensional structures. With that, I come to the end of my talk, and sorry, I ran a two minutes extra. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Um, I was intrigued, you already mentioned here chirality. Yes. So these FD virus particles are chiral. Yes. And if you have these membranes, uh, the membranes are chiral at the outside or at the boundary, does chirality play any role in the self-assembly and disassembly of the vesicles? I saw, for instance, that the theater is, I think, chiral or not. The chirality plays a very large role in determining the structure of the edge, which determines the edge tension, which determines, you know, uh, what the vesicle stability is and what the pore stability is. The structure, you know, the, struct the rods are point aligned normal to the membrane, within the membrane, and then they tilt 90 degrees at the edge of the membrane. And so that, you know, if you actually reduce the, if you increase the chirality, you can in reduce the edge tension, which is actually going to suppress the vesicle formation. But that's something we want to study, for example, when you have a pore, what happens, the pore first has to nucleate, and then we believe, you know, the rods will locally tilt to stabilize the pore, right? We believe we can actually visualize the dynamics of this process. Uh, you know, almost like you can do in computer simulations. And if you assemble these vesicles uh, by sample inversion, yes. there was this tether yes. that looked chiral or not? No, the, the tether, as far as we can tell, is not chiral. The chirality is all expelled to the edge, right? Because, you know, you can't assemble twisted things and you can't twist the sheet, right? So the chirality has to be expelled to the edge. Thanks. Um, Karl Gerich, uh, IST Austria. So you're saying that these, these tubes, the, the two whole states, are, is there any way to actually stabilize them? Because you get them when you go from a larger structure to a smaller structure, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're this dynamic intermediate. You mean this, this elongated tube? Yeah, we're, right. Is there a way to get the, the two whole structure to actually be oh. stabilized by trying to get intermediate sized systems? Is that I, I, one could, you know, well, it's a saddle point, right? So like. I, I think, is it ever not a saddle point? I, I don't, as far as I know, not, right? But I'm, I'm not a theoretician. It would be interesting to imagine what could stabilize this tube-like structure. I, I don't know. And, and the time scale that you see it is basically the time scale at which the, the rods try to leave. Yeah, what's determined determines the free energy landscape changes because you're reducing the size of the vesicle, right? But, uh, uh, you know, you could do that very, very slowly, right? And then, you know, I mean, this happens on a time scale of, of you know, hours, and you could imagine, uh, you know, we're trying to make these these rods with photo cross uh agents, and you could then cross-link it at any point during this transition pathway. Right, thanks. Uh, very interesting. I have a question about how should I think about the evaporation process. Does it happen from the bulk of, of the a membrane or happen from the edge? And if it's happened from the bulk, how does it work in the case you have a closed bicycle? Again, like, so what, what happens is these rods, you know, are one micron in raw length, they'll start assembling. They'll assemble something that's microns in size. That thing becomes quite a bit heavier than the solution and starts slowly sedimenting onto the, onto the, onto the substrate that is coated with 
polyacrylamide repulsive brush, and so they'll float on this brush and continue to assemble in two dimensions, right? Right, but yeah. you said that in uh, low ion strength you have evaporation and it's free. Yes, free yes, yes. How, how does it happen? Uh, I think I think it's individual rods evaporating so from the surface. From, yes, yes, from yes, the surface. yes, yes. I mean, you know, this would actually, you know, one question you could ask is why don't these sheets stack on top of one another? They don't stack on top of one another because they're fluctuating in this direction and that induces a re entropic protrusion-like re repulsion and that's what stabilizes a single sheet. Uh, but, but, you know, once that fluctuation becomes big enough, you can just escape. I, I, I was actually really amazed that the whole thing doesn't disintegrate immediately. Uh, Grant Rotskopf, Stanford. Um, so I, how much heterogeneity is there in the actual individual rods, and how much do you think this contributes to the rate of nucleation of the pores or fracture in the neck? Like when you see these deviations from, you know, yes. continuum elasticity, is that it's being driven by... You know, we, we, so actually, you know, so, so, so what we really like about these viruses in principle, they should all be exactly identical to one another. And so their, their monodispersity is, is really great. They, they'll actually, at some point during their growth, they, they tend to form dimers because they don't dis detach from the bacteria of self surface. But we be, there is evidence indirect that edge, you know, something that actually we realized very lately is they are assembled, we use the dextrin as a depletant. And dextrin as a depletant actually realized is, you know, the one that you buy commercially is very heterogeneous, very unpure. And so, for example, you know, if you use that dextrin, what that, that dextrin will actually have some heterogeneities that we believe absorb onto the edge and suppress the growth. And actually purifying the dextrin was the main trick to getting these things very, very large. But, you know, you'll see, like, if we work with unpure dextran, the edge tension is going to uh, exhibit in intriguing instability from which we can actually measure the Gaussian modulus, which is about 25 kBT, so really, really tiny. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about these two uh, stable points, uh, uh, one fixed and uh, one, one uh, or rather two, Two fixed points, one one stable, another um, settled point, yeah. where the two side, uh, the two radii are the same. Do you have sketches of, of how the uh, what, what the shape of the overall thing is uh, for for this red and yellow? Or can so you? So this is a saddle point, right? Yes, yes. So how, and this how, is a global, a local minima. Right. right. So can, this is a global minima. Yes. Do you have a sketch of the overall shape? So I'm just wondering how it looks, whether each of them, if, whether any of them is like flattish cylinder or... You uh, mean the, once, once it's at this point? Yes. I, I think it's pretty close to, you know, I mean, it would look something like this, or, you know, once okay. it's close. Actually, this is this point, this is uh -huh. this point, so this would ah, be this So it's close to cylinder there? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, okay thank you. Hi. Uh, so, I think you showed earlier that if you quench, if you remove the ionic salt fast, yes, then you yes. only have one hole. Of force, yes. Right? So this would suggest, uh, I would think that this is then almost kinetically driven, where where you get this. So can you do it slow enough, where then you can then inject more rods into the system and then facilitate rod elongation as well? Yeah, or you could, elongation as well. Yeah, I think that would be a great. Yeah, you could like you know th this is slow enough on the order of hours where you could go. You know, well, once once this barrier disappears, then things progress really fast, right? So I don't know if we can trap it here because there is no local minima to trap it, right? So, but one could, you know, play around with, you know, we have a dialysis system where we can dynamically change ionic strength and we are free to explore the phase diagram to the extent where, you know, where there's a local minima, we could probably trap yeah, it. It's basically going to try and minimize that surface area. Yes. So if you give it free monomers, it can grow. That yes, way. no, we could grow, right? I, I, it, it's a little experimentally, it's maybe a little bit tricky to introduce rods because the dialysis, they'll diffuse very slowly, right? But we could like definitely stop, you know, we can change ionic strength and stop the, the leakage, right? 
you know, one thing is you can actually also crystallize these things. If you, if you increase the ionic strength, you can make a solid membrane as well. So this is Alex yes. from Iowa State again. I, I just, yes. So this issue about the Gaussian, the reason why I yes. ask is because, I mean, there has been a lot of yes. um, back and forth in the literature. Yes. And, so on. and in this case, you seem to be able to really measure these very precisely. Yes. And the other, and this term only matters when you have a topology change. Yes. Yes. Uh, so when you do all these calculations, do you put that term in there or does not matter at this level? I think, yeah, we do put it in the term, but the thing that is very unusual about the system is that the bending modulus is 11,000 kBT yeah. and the Gaussian modulus is about 25 kBT, right? Y yeah, but when you create a <laughs> But, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's why this thing, we be I believe, creates this, you know, because of the Gaussian modulus that is, the Gaussian modulus, as I always get confused, it's positive, this thing favors saddle splay surface, right? That's why you get this kind of uh, uh, neck formation. And, and how do you measure it? Do you fit it to the shape or what do you do? The, the way we measure the Gaussian modulus is, you know, if you have a flat sheet, there's an instability, right, where a flat sheet, for example, okay, well, I wasn't going to go there, right? But for example here, right, if I mix two rods, one with another, at some point, this flat rod will become, uh, will form a saddle splay surface that's shown over here, right? And there's this transition from a, a, a uniform flat sheet to the saddle splay-like surface but that occurs just by doping with a second component rod, right? And looking, for example, at the transition between these two points can lead to an estimate of where, of what the saddle, what the Gaussian modulus is, right? Because this minimizes the Gaussian modulus. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's, we've measured it in three different ways, and they all seem to be quali quanti qualitatively agreeing with one another. One question by Xiaoming. Okay, this is Xiaoming from uh, University of Michigan. So uh, I'm wondering, it, you showed that at a certain parameter range, the vesicles get pretty flat, like a red blood cell. Yes. And uh, I wonder, are there phases where you see it become uh, having non-trivial topology, like a torus or a double torus? You asked, right? I, so for example, here, is a process of coalescence where you have two of these sheets and you can actually see this happens through a very conserved pathway. And you know, you have something where you have a poor opening and at the end, you end up with something that is a catenoid-like structure, right? And if you watch for a longer time, you observe the zoo of three-dimensional shapes that have highly not complex uh, topologies, right? And we are doing that by controlling the Gaussian curvature modulus. And so we believe we, we can actually assemble a kind of nanoparticle gyroid phase with these kind of materials. Uh, That's really cool. So, so each of the surface there is two layers, right? No, this is a single layer. The big difference layer. between this system and lipid bilayers is that these are monolayer membranes instead of a bilayer membrane. I see. Yeah, beautiful. This is how you're from Arizona State, and um, it's a very nice talk. So I'm just curious about uh, your future directions. You mentioned you want to do the photo cross-linking of vesicles. Yes. yes. Do you have to put any modifications to your membrane so they have so they can actually can go cross-link? Yeah. So you, you, I mean, there's primary means you can easily Does modify that the surface. Does that affect the assembly? Huh? Hmm? Does that affect the assembly? Well, I mean, all of these things were visualized by fluorescently labeling. Okay. The rods, right? And Depending on the density, graphing density. Yeah, probably. but it seems to be robust, but depends really on the dye. If you have a big bulky fluorescent dye, you okay. know. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can specifically label one or the other ends, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the proteins at the ends are different. And so you could, you know, graft, you know, DNA on one end or the other end and, you know, start making sticky materials. You see. Cool. Thank you. Okay. We have to unfortunately wrap it up. The time is over. So let's thank Tony Miracle. Thank you. Yes.
of course, always more, more time for questions in the, uh, in the uh, lunch break afterwards. <laughs>